Hi, this is your CyberPath. We're the podcast that helps you get your dream cybersecurity job. I'm Kip Boyle, and I'm an experienced hiring manager of cybersecurity professionals. This episode is available as an audio-only recording in your favorite podcast app, and it's also a video that you can find on our YouTube channel. Just go to that website and search for Your CyberPath Podcast. Now, due to the recent Kaseya supply chain cyber attack, Today, I'm going to share with you a replay of a continuing legal education course that I recently put on with my friend and colleague, Jake Bernstein. And in this session, using ordinary language, we're going to walk you through two actual ransomware incidents that we've handled. And this will include how the attack started, how the victim recovered, and the role of the attorney throughout the incident. So not only is this relevant because of the historic ransomware attack, but it will also help you understand one other really important thing. When you're working in cybersecurity, at times you'll find yourself working with lawyers who will be on the same team as you. Okay, before we get to the training, I want you to consider grabbing our free guide. It's called Play to Win, Getting Your Dream Cybersecurity Job. And it describes how taking a capture the flag approach is gonna help you compete and win in your job hunting. It's a really helpful 20 page visual guide and you should check it out. Just go to yourcyberpath.com forward slash PDF. That's yourcyberpath.com forward slash PDF. Check it out. Tell me what you like. Tell me what you don't like so I can fix it. But in any event, I want you to remember that you're just one path away from your dream cybersecurity job. Uh, thanks, everybody, for uh, for joining us. We really appreciate it. And you know, we want to get started. Now, I'll just say up front, that we're going to record the session and you will receive a replay link shortly after we wrap today, probably in the next day or two. Right, Melinda? Yeah. Okay, great. So um, yeah, so you'll be able to, to, to watch it again and uh, feel free to share it with anybody else who would like to check it out who couldn't be here. Uh, the only caveat is, is that we can give continuing legal edu education credits if you're actually participating today on the replay, we can't do that, but that's okay because I think our content's going to be pretty helpful. And so, uh, even if, even if you don't get a you know a CLE credit for it, um, you know I, I hope the replay is is helpful. So, so that's that's what's going on with the replay. So uh, I'm Kip Boyle, and I'm the co-host of the Cyber Risk Management Podcast. Jake Bernstein's here. He's he's also the co-host. So thanks for being here, Jake. We're both co-hosts mm -hmm. of the Cyberist. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. <laughs> we are. And then also with us today is Melinda Miller. Melinda is going to be our facilitator today. So uh, welcome, Melinda. And would you, would you mind telling folks how we're going to run things today in terms of questions and answers and so forth? Yeah, absolutely. So hi, everyone. I'm really excited to be here with all of you. Um, I gave Kip and Jake the hard part of doing the presenting. Um, I'm just here to be the helper in the background. So if you have any questions during the presentation, feel free to put them in your chat and I will answer all the ones that I can and the ones that are better suited for Kip and Jake, I will save that for the open Q&A that we will be doing at the end of the presentation. Um, if I think that should be everything. Um, Kip, am I missing anything important? Well, I think, uh, you know, in the, uh, when we do transition into Q&A, how would you like people to signal that they have a queue for us to A? Um, for any questions, you can raise your hand. There should be a little raise your hand button at the bottom of your screen. Um, and then as soon as we answer your question, if you could just put your hand down so I can keep track of them better. Great. Yeah, that'll be fine. All right, so let's get going here. So today, what we uh, what we're going to share with you all is um, two ransomware cases that Jake and I have worked on, and we're going to do that in a way that we hope is going to be accessible to you. We're not going to use any jargon if we need to. You know, we're going to make sure we define terms, and and we're going to really focus on helping you as the attorney. Uh, to know what to do if a client of yours finds themselves in either uh, in a ransomware attack in progress or if they get concerned about the idea that they could become the victim of a ransomware attack, 
what, you know, how can you advise them? How can, how can you help them and give them counsel? Um, that's right, Jake, isn't it? That's what we're going to do today. Uh, it is, uh, you know, I can't promise that we won't use some jargony language. Uh, it's my favorite thing to do other than, you know, well, be a you podcast can... co-host. So, so we'll, uh, we'll define that as, it, as necessary. Well, you can use the legal jargon, I think, with, with complete impunity. I, I'm, <clears throat> I'm just talking about the tech jargon. So fair enough. Okay, cool. All right. So, uh, so I'm the, I'm a virtual chief information security officer. Uh, Jake is an attorney at law at uh, K&L Gates. I work at uh, my own company that I founded called Cyber Risk Opportunities. And uh, just an open invitation. If any, if anybody would like to reach out to, to us and have a conversation, we would love to hear from you. Our contact information is here. We'll also provide you with these slides um, in the next day or two so that you can uh, take a look at them later on if you'd like. And again, with our, our contact information on there. So, okay. Um, oh, and then our podcast. So I, um, I encourage you, if, if you're not a podcast listener now, please go ahead and, and, and check it out. We've got some really great episodes there. Um, we just recorded episode 83 the other day. And when we started this, I was just like, oh man, I hope we can make it last a year. <laughs> and we've, We've definitely done better than that. And so I yeah, I just want to encourage you guys to go check out the podcast. Okay, so let's get started. So what is ransomware? And uh and you know, there's a lot of technical you know aspects to what is ransomware. We can talk about how it actually gets into systems. We can we can talk about how technically it uses encryption algorithms and you know how how um how do the keys get uh, you know, use to encrypt data, and then and then why do you have to pay money to get a key to get a key back? We don't want to go into all those technical details. We want to keep it. We want to keep it understandable and 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 relevant here. Okay, so ransomware is a form of malicious code or malware. Malware is a combination of malicious software. And that's kind of where that little term comes from. And you you probably know this, but in case you don't. The, the whole thing here, the way it works is, is that somehow a cyber criminal gets this malicious code onto a data network and it uh, finds all the, inf all the data, all the sensitive data, especially, and encrypts it and then, and then hides the key from the owner of the data. So they still have possession of the data, but they can't use it because it's encrypted using a key that, that they don't possess. Um, so... And that's the basis for, for the ransom, right? So pay us money, typically a cryptocurrency, often Bitcoin, sometimes it's Ethereum or something else. And, um, you know, and then, and then we'll give you your, the key and then you can use the key to, to decrypt the data. So that's kind of the essence of it. I mean, this is just a modern day kidnapping or, or asset, uh, you know, asset um, uh, ransomware type, type of, a, uh, of an approach, right? It's a crime and, it's just that today it can be done digitally and it can be done at a distance. Right, Jake? And yes, indeed. And so one of the problems that because it's digital and it can be done at a distance, uh, it can also be automated. And that is really one of the biggest problems with ransomware as opposed to, you know, uh, old school bank robberies, right? In order, to, in order to commit an old school bank robbery, you have to physically go uh, to a bank and attempt to rob it. Uh, you can only do one of those, you know, I think if you were really industrious, maybe you could hit a couple banks a day. Um, but you know, you're, you're really risking your, yourself every time with ransomware. On the other hand, you can sit back, push a button and you can hit thousands, hundreds of thousands, really, depending on the circumstances of victims all at once at, at, at no physical risk to yourself. And, and, you know, one of the problems that we'll see is, perhaps not a great deal of risk to yourself overall. Um, you know, ransomware, it, it, the numbers just continue to increase uh, over the course of 2020 and into 2021, um, you know, massive percentage increase, targeting everybody, obviously large companies, but also, also medium and small. Uh, really, everybody is at risk. Uh, if, you have an, if you have data, that you would like to maintain access to, and you're connected to the internet, you're at risk of ransomware. And one of the things that's that I would say is is kind of a somewhat new variation. At this point, it's it's less new, but it, this little flyer here calls it ransomware 2.0. 
And that is the idea that we're going to combine the encryption with basically a, a data breach threat. So, oh, you have good backups. Well, that's just fine. If you don't pay us the ransom, we'll get, we're going to go ahead and release the data anyway. So it becomes a breach. So it's kind of a redundancy for the criminals. Right. A redundancy in the sense that if you have great data backups and you, and you say, well, I don't need to purchase the, um, right. the, the, uh, the decryption key from you. Well, the cyber criminals have gotten wise to that. And so they're like, okay, well, we have other ways of torturing you to get a payment out of you. So yeah, there's, um, there's a lot of permutations and, and they continue to innovate the way that they attack us. So um, you can get taunted over Twitter. Uh, your, you know, your, your, the executives of the company can be uh, taunted. You can, you know, so you can, you, this can turn into a public relations nightmare, uh, more than just a technology problem. This can become a real, a real business issue. Not to mention, not and, and of course, not the least of which is the potential for bankruptcy or severe financial, uh, you know, distress on a company. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the details here in a moment, but, you know, one of the companies that Jake and I worked with earlier this year, uh, a couple of weeks after, uh, after we had our last conversation with them, they reached out to us and, and confided that this was such a traumatic event com com combined with some other things that they were dealing with, that they were going to, uh, dissolve the company. So, you know, this, this can be, this can change the trajectory of, of a company's, uh, evolution. Now we also wanted to, you know, just re really emphasize the fact that everybody's at risk for this, and you can see some of the latest statistics here on the screen. Government organizations, and that would include cities, that would include um, uh, uh, just the police departments inside of cities, uh, water districts, and that sort of thing. That's under utility. School, school districts. School districts, right. Uh, well, education, right? Education's down there. But some of the highest profile ransomware attacks were against the uh, city of Baltimore, the city of Atlanta, and so forth. So, you know, think about your clients, think about who you serve, and, you know, take a look at this, this bar graph here and just get some idea about who's, who's most susceptible to a ransomware attack. One thing this bar graph doesn't show is large organization versus medium versus small. And I just want to emphasize that it really doesn't matter how big you are. The, um, the economies of scale that the attackers are using to, to come after us are so in their favor that they can afford to attack anybody of any size in any industry. So, you know, smaller organizations that think, well, you know, I'm not a target, is, that's absolutely not the case. All right. So with that preamble, let's go ahead and talk about the two, the two cases that, um, uh, that we wanted to share with you. Now, now obviously, we've sanitized the information to, to protect client confidentiality. So we're going to talk about a client X, and we're going to talk about client Y. And they both went through pretty similar experiences. And so, but we're going to point out the, um, you know, where they were the same, where they were different. And, you know, Jake's going to take client X. I'm going to talk about uh, client Y. And, I'm going to hand it over to Jake here in a moment, but uh, let's let's begin at the beginning. How how does a ransomware attack begin? So, and I think I think that's one of the questions that everyone really should be asking themselves on a regular basis because it it often gets I think it often gets um, ignored or or not or not uh, not investigated closely enough, right? Um, obviously, if you have gone through an incident response process, you know that finding kind of patient zero is an important thing to do. You need to, you need to know how the bad guys got in so that you can make sure that they're not still in or that they don't just come right back. Uh, in this particular case, what was happening is that the client, one of client X's customers, so there's a, there's a third party involved here, um, their website was itself compromised. And so what happened is, is that one of client X's business folks went to the website of their customer, and they saw this pop-up. Uh, you know, you're using an older version of Chrome. You should update. Well, Chrome updates fairly regularly. It's not an implausible uh, type of message. Um, you know, with this is the type of thing that, with really strong cybersecurity awareness training, you would you would try to get people not to fall for. Uh, unfortunately, this individual 
either was in a hurry or, or just didn't, didn't realize, clicked update. And very, very quickly, uh, as you'll see in a moment, uh, the, the, the kind of malware was downloaded and its payload was, was released. And we'll, we'll get into that. Right. Now, um, for client Y, due to the fact, due to the way the IT department responded to the problem, which is to say that they began to re-image machines immediately, thinking that that was the, the, the best uh, way out of the situation, they destroyed so much evidence in the process of doing that even even when we came on the scene and we said, you know, stop, we, we need, we're going to need some evidence here in order to, um, you know, help you out. <clears throat> we, we really couldn't determine the source of the infection uh, with with great certainty. But but by looking at the different systems, we believe theorizing that it was their remote access server that was that was the source of the infection. And that lines up pretty well with the statistics that we're seeing now, as far as you know, what are the common uh, ways that that malware is getting delivered into organizations. So sometimes it's it's a click and sometimes um, it's it's a compromised set of credentials that leads to um, to a remote access um, situation. So Anyway, so these are two very common ways that ransomware attacks begin. And in this case, that's, that's exactly what we uh, experienced with these two clients. Now, Jake, this was, this was your uh, ransom note, right? It is. So with Client X, you know, usually you get a ransom note. In the past, ransom notes would actually include the ransom. Uh, one of the things that made this uh, Evil Corp example uh, interesting was that it didn't. Basically, they said, uh, your systems are encrypted, contact us to get details. That was it. And, you know, you can see, uh, I suppose one can appreciate how short and to the point this is. Uh, you'll note that they provided three separate, you know, and these, if you happen to know these domains, these are untraceable. These are so-called anonymous email addresses. And then the, uh, the cryptographic key, that's there so that you can, uh, you know, identify, it's, it's, it's there so that, Basically, it's your customer identification number um, with the ransomware gang. Um, it's how they know who you are and where you're, what kind of uh, information to give you. So, um, yep, this is uh, this particular type of ransomware was called Wasted Locker, and as far you know, attribution is a very complicated thing. Uh, but as best as anyone could tell, this one was um, evil, a Russian gang called Evil Corp. Yep, and. Um... This is this is this is a, a pretty typical uh, ransom note that you'll encounter. Let me go ahead and show you. Um, oh, <laughs> lovely little animations in our slide deck, Jake. Did you did you mention the ransom amount? <laughs> so in this case, it actually was seventy five Bitcoin. Um, at the time when the ransom was made, that was worth about nine hundred seventy five thousand. Um, a couple of weeks ago, or actually, like I think it was two weeks ago, um, I used this slide and I calculated that it was more like 2.7 million in, in today's dollars. Bitcoin has fallen a little since then, so maybe it's maybe it's 2.3 million. Still a lot of money. Yeah, quite a bit. And why would the um, you know why would they ask such a high ransom? And it's typically because. You know, once they get into your network, whether it's you know somebody clicks on something they shouldn't, or a remote access server gets compromised, they are getting in silently. And I think that's really important for people to understand: is there is no visible um, indicator that you've been compromised. A lot of people who've been using computers for a lot of years are kind of used to noisy malicious code, you know, that comes in and and, and you know that you're that you've been infected right away. And this stuff isn't like that at all. This is silent. And so they will be in your network anywhere from days to weeks uh, preparing your network for the actual attack. One of the things that uh, many of these ransomware gangs will do, in fact, is they'll have uh, a group of people go off and locate your data backups and kind of do all the technical stuff. Then they'll have another team of people go off to your finance areas, and they'll actually study your internal uh, accounting systems to find out what uh, you know, how much cash you have on hand and how much cash you can get quickly. And they'll base the ransom amount on an actual analysis of your financials, which I think says a lot about the, um, 
the sophistication of the of the attackers that we're that we're dealing with here. So the ransom note for for client Y uh, it looked a little different. And so here you can see a screenshot where where we actually held a smartphone up to the monitor and actually took a, took a picture of the uh, of the ransom note. So in this case for client Y, it was a a ransom. A, a piece of ransomware called Sodno Kibi, which is which is rampant now. And another thing, another term of a phrase that I want you to understand is called ransomware as a service. So if you know what software as a service is, right? Office 365 is software as a service, is all kinds of other Salesforce. Well, so the criminal gangs have borrowed that business model. They now provide malicious code on demand to uh they're affiliates. So you can be somebody who wants to commit digital crimes, but doesn't have any technical skills to actually write the software to do that. But that's okay, because if you can sign up for a Netflix account, you can actually become an affiliate. And so by becoming an affiliate, they will supply you with all the technology that you need. And then you can go off and you can infect people. And when you get paid the ransom as the affiliate, the developers of Sodno Kibi will, will retain 20 to 30% of the ransom and they'll share with you 70 to 80% of you know, the lion's share of the ransom. So it's very much like an app store, right? So Apple's app store kind of does the same thing. It's about a 70, 30 uh, split of revenue with, the, uh, with the, uh, the actual application publishers. So in this particular ransom note, um, the criminals alleged that they stole 80 gigabytes of personal and company data. So not only were they saying you need to pay us to get the key to, to you know, get access to your data again, but if you don't pay us, then we're going to auction off all of your sensitive data to, uh, to the public. Uh, and um, yeah, and, and they're not kidding. In this case, uh, 39 Bitcoins, about $500,000. This was earlier in 2021. So big money. And uh, by the way, this is this is a, another screenshot that we took from uh, the Happy Blog, uh, an interesting and ironic name. So the 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 cyber criminals that run the Sodno Kibi ransomware as a service actually maintain on the uh, the so-called dark web a website that will uh, where they list the different victims of their uh, schemes and where they will actually. Uh, sell off the data for, for, the, for the companies that don't pay the ransom. Here's a screenshot. So we were checking this every day, sometimes twice a day, to find out if our, if our client was going to uh, actually show up on there. They never did. But while we were taking a look at it, we actually saw uh, one of their victims was a, uh, was a, a law office who had some uh, legal documents related to Jessica Simpson. So... Um, yes, even law firms can become the victims of a ransomware attack and client files are at stake. And, and this is just awful, just absolutely awful stuff. I, I, hope, none of, I hope nobody on this uh, session today has to go through this because it, it's the worst. I would say especially law firms, but mm -hmm. that's not the focus of this particular CLE. We have a different one for that. Um, so client X... This is what this is really interesting. Their ransomware incident, it, you can learn a lot. This is a timeline from the forensic firm, and and this required um, a lot of work to generate. Right? This is this is weeks later, um, and it it shows you what you know what actually happens with the uh, with the attack. And I think that one of the really scary but also important things to recognize is the top. Really, uh, I guess almost ten, maybe maybe a little bit under ten entries. They're all on the same day, and if you look at what happens here, the malware gets downloaded. And remember, that's when the person clicked on the update Chrome link at at three thirty eight and thirty one seconds. The malware is executed within nine seconds of being downloaded. The what we call a second stage payload basically uh, another another form of malware to kind of increase the sophistication of the control um, was installed and mo and going within another, yeah, I call it five minutes. And then within seven minutes after that, the, the threat actor 
the bad guys were literally inside doing network discovery. Um, and I think what's almost worse is that less than half an hour later, the uh, patient zero, the, the, the bad guys were able to escalate and get local credentials and, and admin credentials, which basically means that they are getting very close to uh, control of that particular computer. And then, uh, oh, look, it took them almost five hours longer to actually get domain admin accounts. This is frighteningly fast. Um, and it shows that, you know, th this, this, uh, this victim's server was affected uh, within the first day, really within five hours of the attack. And then you can, uh, you can see that they, then they take a while, right? Then it's all the way down to, you know, really it's the 25th of October when, when the actual ransomware attack is triggered. That would be the start of ransomware encryption, which is the last entry. So what were they doing that whole time? Well, one, let's be honest, these are busy, these are busy criminals. So they're also dealing with other victims. Um, some of this, some of this now does require some human intervention. Uh, so that's part of what they were doing is just, you know, going along, but they're also doing a lot of internal scans, reconnaissance and preparing. Uh, you can see that there's a couple of different, uh, pink highlights of, of kind of showing what they were, other actions they were taking in support of their, of their attack. And that, that third to last one is, is important. Uh, Webroot is just a, an antivirus type of security program, and you can see that uh, just before they started the ransomware, they 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 instructed the whole network to uninstall Webroot, which means that everything was open to the attack. So, you know, if, if what I my takeaway for the audience for this is, you know, if if you're talking to a client and they they say things like, "Well, I have an IT guy." and uh they handle this kind of stuff you know they you know we've got we've got antivirus we've got our basic procedures they're just not good enough um and that's not the fault of the it guy or the basic procedures it's about how sophisticated these these uh threat actors are so you know my my hope is that you know you'll look at this and you'll you'll go back to clients who ask you for basic advice on ransomware and say push deeper than just you know, our IT guy is taking care of it. Ultimately, it's the it's the business owner who suffers um, when that when this goes wrong. So, right. So it took four weeks, roughly, for the attackers to position themselves to actually launch the attack and and realize too. And this is important: they were not detected. Nobody at the victim company had any idea that this was going on until they until they struck. So this yeah. is absolutely insidious. Uh, and I think that it makes the point that we are outgunned. Think about the people, the IT staff that we've entrusted, the software that we've, that we've purchased and installed, and it's impotent to, to deal with this. And I want to highlight Alex Raiders, uh, who's, who's, in the, uh, who's in the chat. He's one of the, uh, the attendees today. He says, Webroot, Webroot is an extremely effective piece of software. I, and I don't, I, you know, there's nothing at all about Webroot that I am, that's, you know, we're disparaging. It's a good piece of software. It doesn't matter how good your software is. If the, if the enemy, uh, if, the, if the computer thinks the enemy is the administrator and listens to the command to uninstall the defenses, it doesn't matter how good your defenses are. Yeah. You're done. I'm, I'm thinking of the old Star Trek movie, Wrath of Khan. <laughs> where uh, where Kirk figures out the code for Khan's uh, stolen starship, and he drops the shields while while Khan is you know standing there, and suddenly becomes exposed, and this, then the Enterprise strikes, and um, you know I just think you know Hollywood isn't very reliable for illustrating a lot of things having to do with cyber risk, but that was one of the times when I thought they did do a good job. So all right. <laughs> Let's take a look at the uh, the client why uh, ransomware incident. You can see there's an awful lot of redaction on here, um, but it really follows the similar pattern. Okay, so we were able to, even though a lot of the evidence was destroyed, we were able to pick up the trail on December 13th, and you can and you can see in here that the Windows Server was exploited for the admin credentials, and then it wasn't until early March, and then finally mid March 
when the ransomware was was activated. And and you know, as Jake said, you know what's what's the deal with the delay? Well, it's a combination of they needed to prepare the 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 victim for uh, to be fully exploited, but we also theorize that they had a lot of, a lot of other victims that they had to attend to and there's really no rush right because if they're in and they're silent and they're undetected then there's really not a tremendous sense of urgency for them to get on with the attack it's it's very unlikely that they're going to lose that access while they're preparing uh for for the attack so and and, and just on this particular one there were no forensic there were very there were very limited forensic records to review so there's it's also the case that we just don't know what they did between mm -hmm. mid early december and, and march right okay so so that's kind of the you know the summary of how it all started now at this point you might be you might be wondering like well who are these people that are that are conducting these attacks and you know attribution for cyber attacks on the internet is very difficult generally speaking um, not only is it difficult to really pinpoint where um, attacks come from because they can be shunted through multiple different computers before they actually arrive and you can typically only trace them back one you know to the last computer that 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 the attack came from but there are standard tactics, techniques, and procedures, and um, and you know, so there are some signatures. There are some ways to figure this out with a, with a reasonable amount of confidence. It's difficult to get high or 100% confidence, but uh, but but our belief is is that Evil Corp, a Russian gang, is was behind the Client X um, attack. And uh, how do you, how do they say that, Jake? Is it is it our our evil? evil. Yeah, it's our evil. Our evil. It's funny, you know, they brand all these. Uh, attacks and all these gangs, but um, you know there, there's no easy easy way to know how you're supposed to pronounce this stuff. Anyway, our evil uh, is a different Russian gang, so they're both using evil, but those are monikers that we've given them, right? They didn't come out and say this is our name. Um, but what's interesting to note is that these these are individuals who are known to law enforcement in the United States. And we have sanctioned many of them, both in Russia and in China, but they're really outside of our reach. We, we cannot apprehend them and bring them to any kind of trial because we're not, uh, you know, they're, they're just, there's no extradition treaty. There's really no way for us to bring them to justice without the full cooperation of their governments. And their governments are really not interested in fully cooperating with us on this. In fact, their governments benefit quite a bit from this, both in terms of the economic dis uh, disruption uh, for us, but also because a lot of this data that's being grabbed is um, not only used to, you know, to get payments, but can also be uh, handed over to the intelligence services in order to, in order to help them with their missions. So, this is one of the big problems with ransomware, is um, is that you know we we the the, the amount of arrests. I think the the statistic around arrest is only three in a thousand reported cyber crimes result in an arrest, and if, in a thousand cyber crimes, that's that's the tip of the iceberg. Most the vast majority of cyber crimes are actually never reported. So okay, so so there's you know kind of how it how it happened, who's behind it. Let's now talk about how do you respond to this. Jake. So the the incident response process, it, there's a number of different perspectives that you need to take with it. One is the technical perspective, and we'll also talk about the legal perspective. With the technical perspective, you're looking at um, you know basically four work streams that are kind of happening all at the same time, followed by um, you what we'll kind of get to later, but you need to the absolute most important thing is to start gathering information. If you don't have the information, then you don't know what to investigate and you can't, you can't eventually get to eradication. Uh, the second most important thing is to contain the, the response. If you haven't contained it, then it's going to just continue affecting you and you don't really know, um, you know, there's no, you need to stop the bleeding and that's what the containment is doing. That's putting on the bandages and, and getting that all kind of tied off. And then it's about recovery and then monitoring, which is really part of recovery. And what you need to be doing there is, um, you know, possibly rebuilding your network, 
Um, the monitoring is, you know, how do you make sure that you're not getting reinfected again? I don't know the exact statistic right this minute. I'm sure it changes, but it is not uncommon for uh, victims to be re-victimized within days or weeks of thinking that they have solved the issue. So that's a, it's a real, real problem. Ready for the next slide? Yes. All right. So how do you, how, you know, once you, so once you've, you've contained the outbreak and, and you, and you know how it started, you can now begin the recovery process. So how do you actually get back, you know, control of your systems and how do you get back in business? Because this whole time that you're reacting to the ransomware attack, you're probably not serving customers. You're probably not doing any of the things that you normally do. You could have an entire workforce that is idled. And uh, you know, not not even doing anything. You know, the payroll is running, but 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 nobody is being served. So there's a there's a couple of different ways that that you can get back from this. What you're seeing here on the on the slide, this roadmap to production, this is showing you a situation where you you're going from the left to the right, and you've got this so-called dirty production network, right? So this is these are the computers that you use to run your your business. It, they're dirty. They're they're infested with malicious code. So. Some people uh, approach this by saying, we're just going to burn everything down. In other words, just throw everything away and we're just going to buy new computers and we're going to start all over again because they feel like that's the best path back to um, having a, a high integrity environment where they can do work and trust that their systems and their data are everything that they need to be. Other people, for various reasons, can't do that or don't feel like that's what they that's um, the best way to go. You can have a situation like that where you have highly customized computers where you know you you don't have backups of the configurations. And so you find yourself in a situation where you've got to actually try to clean, somehow take compromised machines and turn them into clean machines. And there and there are ways to do that. And that's what this is showing you here. So you take a compromised network, you quarantine it. Then what you do is you is you pass it through what's called a laundry network, and that's where you are looking at the servers one by one, possibly in groups, and you are uh, purging them of the malicious code as best you can. You're installing updates, whether that means new operating systems or, or just missing patches. You might have some backup data that you can use, but you're sort of piecing, you know, using pieces pieces and parts and in isolation. And then when you're done with that. You're, you're back into production again. You know, you have a so-called new normal and, and then you can continue. So, so there's a couple of different ways that you can, um, that you can recover from this. There, there may be other, other ways on top of that, but these are the two things, these are the two ways we're seeing. You know, it's interesting, Kip. I, um, as you were talking through that slide, I thought to myself, gosh, that actually isn't all that different than what the pandemic looked like in terms of a response. Um, oh. You know, we had the we had the infection compromise, and then we we went into quarantine. Literally the same word, quarantine. Um, and then the laundry was, you know, getting vaccinations and and masks and all that stuff. And and yeah, you know, we haven't hit the new normal yet, but we will. So yeah, you know, and, why and, should you? And and by the way, th there's a reason why these are called viruses. You know, they they behave in yeah. strikingly similar ways to biology. Yep, that's very true. That's also where we get our one of our favorite little terms, uh, cyber hygiene from. And and uh, I see the question in, in the chat, how would you defend yourself from an attack? That's really a very different kind of presentation. We're not going to cover that today. Um, well, we're going to we're going to we're going to dive into it just a little bit towards the end. A little bit. Cyber hygiene. It, yes, to some degree. Cyber hygiene is part of that. And we'll get there. So yep. why would you ever pay? Um, well, uh, the first reason is that, you know, if the bad guys did their job well, in other words, if they if the encryption was effective, then you know with modern technology, you can't break it, right? It's going to take millions of years to get through the, any kind of uh, legitimate modern encryption. Um, uh, you know, another reason you might not pay is if you don't have recent enough data to restore. Uh, maybe you do have a backup, but you know, it was three weeks old and you just closed a major deal a week ago and you just cannot live without that, that, that information. Um, perhaps you think it's going to be faster or cheaper or easier. Uh, you know, this, the second to last one here is 
maybe the cyber criminals won't release my data. That's a tough one. Uh, that's that's a that's a that's actually a different set of considerations than than the technical kind of recovery piece. Uh, and the last one is really interesting. You know, insurance companies uh, possibly could insist that you pay, um, although that's I think that would be potentially uh, less common. So, you know, there are there. You know, I think I think sometimes the incident responders and the cybersecurity industry can look at people who pay and say, oh, how could you ever pay? Don't you know that paying just, you know, is a vote for more ransomware? I know that's that's what we often say. That's um, what I say. But that's what Kip says. There, But there are reasons why you might need to pay. I mean, all of this is assuming that, you know, it's pay or your business goes away. So if that's, if the, yeah. that's why you might pay. Yeah. So why might you not pay? Well, uh, a free decryption key might be available. So it turns out that a lot of this malware is actually written in a very shoddy way. They, they actually didn't uh, you know, do a very good job of implementing the encryption and, and we can actually get samples of this malicious code and we can actually reverse engineer it and figure out how to uh, get around the lack of a key. So always, you know, always be sure to look for the availability of a key. And, and we've got a, a URL down at the bottom of the slide there, nomoreransom.org. So go look for a key that would, you know, uh, possibly allow you to not pay uh, if you have enough recent data to return to business. So a lot of people do that. They just restore from backups because they, they you know, they've done a good job either, either, either deliberately or accidentally. They've, they've been able to keep the ransomware from encrypting their backups which by the way, in, uh, ransomware increasingly is getting more and more sophisticated at locating your online backups and encrypting them before they actually strike or disabling them, the, the backups and deleting so that when you go to get to them, you know, they're not available. Um, you know, you might, not, you might not pay because you don't trust the criminals to keep their promises. If you pay us this much Bitcoin, we'll, we'll give you a key. It sounds like smacking the easy button, right? Just throw money at the problem and I get out of, uh, you know, and I escape from this awful situation. But, you know, what we're finding is roughly half the time the criminals don't keep their word. They either take the money and run or they figure, well, you paid this much, you'll pay again. And, and they'll try to extort you a second time. Um, or just to, to add something to that, sometimes the criminals do keep their word, but the fact is, is that, that the encryption wasn't perfect. And so their key just doesn't work all the way. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. another, that's another reason why you might not bother paying is that even if everything, even if everyone does what they say they're going to do, and there's some honor among thieves, uh, still may not work. No guarantees. You know, I mean, they're criminals, not technologists, although they, they obviously have a lot of good tech people in their employ. But I, I understand, and only from reading what you know, what's generally available in the press, that Colonial Pipeline paid, got the key, but the but the decryption rate was so slow, so obscenely slow, that even though they thought back uh, restoring from their own backups were going to be time consuming, that's what they ended up doing anyway. So. Um, that's a terrible situation to get yourself into. Um, you know, I'm a bit of a boy scout and my perspective is, is like, I don't want to be paying ransoms because it's gonna just reward cyber criminals. It's gonna give them more money to conduct new attacks. And I don't want my business attacked with the money that, that somebody, you know, in another state paid to a criminal who then turned it around and used it to attack me. It's a tragedy of the commons. So if, you've, if you're familiar with that little turn of phrase, I, I think that's what's going on here. And then um, another issue is that the cyber criminal could be on a sanctions list maintained by the US government through the Office of Foreign uh, Asset Control. And, and if they are and you pay them, then you could actually find yourself in a world of hurt for violating uh, US sanctions against uh, against either individuals by name or by nation states. And because that's where a lot of this ransomware is actually coming from. This is a big source of hard currency for the North Koreans so that they can continue to pursue their nuclear ambitions and so on and so forth. So, you know, those, those are some of the reasons that, um, that we may, may not want to pay. Okay, so what, what so are the consequences of this? They're, they're bad. They're, the consequences are bad and they, they come in several flavors. Um, you've, got, you've got the direct kind of basic consequences. Uh, for this particular client, it was a total business shutdown for 
almost a month, right? So just you just take into consideration what that would mean, right? No other, you know, even if you take out all the other consequences, um, you're taking a three or four week unplanned vacation. That's not good. Um, then there are the incident response costs. This is, you know, mid to high six figures, really depending upon uh, how, how deep you go. Um, you know, you're paying for not only the investigation and the analysis, but also you might need to rebuild your entire network. Uh, you probably do need to. Some clients will literally go new out of box machines. Um, if you have a if you have a virtual kind of infrastructure in place, then you're it's not quite as expensive because you're you're wiping the uh, the machines that run the machines. Um, legal costs can add up pretty quickly. Uh, there's a lot of notification uh, obligations under various state law. You may need to pay for credit monitoring services. And think about this. Um, even just postage, if you have to mail, you know, a few hundred thousand letters, even postage begins to add up fairly quickly and the printing costs. So, you know, all of that is a, is a direct consequence. And then obviously if you pay the ransom, that's also a direct one. Indirect consequences though are, are also quite, uh, quite scary and harder to, harder to measure. Um, staff can become exhausted. They may quit. Uh, they may miss something because they're exhausted, which can cause more problems. Uh, you may have customer churn because you are not able to deliver services, for example, because you're shut down for four and a half or three and a half weeks. Um, and, and then there's, there's the unknown future liability once this happens. I mean, I think, you know, th this, is, this is a traumatic event for the business and for all the people involved. And it takes a while to come out of it, um, even if everything goes well for you. Yep. So guess what? Client X, you know, this is kind of what happened to them. Client Y, um, pretty similar, right? Total business shutdown, different time period, but, um, but, but about a month, about four weeks of complete inability to serve customers. Now they did not pay the ransom. So, uh, you know, so they restored from backup. So while they're avoiding the back, uh, the ransom costs, they still have to pay their teams to to do the backups, and 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 those poor folks were were practically working twenty four hours a day, day after day after day after day. I mean, it was a mountain of of heroics in order to uh, to get them back up and running again. So, um, Jake, why don't you talk about the specific legal perspective? Right. So if if a if a client calls you and and you're you know you're being asked to provide some kind of incident response process you know this is what you need to think about and and yes on on one hand this is a very specialized practice area you know i don't think everyone uh everyone needs to be able to do it however it's also becoming so common that the odds of being a you know a typical business lawyer and getting this type of request or this this type of you know cry for help are really going up pretty high. And these are the things that you want to think about. Uh, first and foremost, you want to maintain attorney-client privilege with the incident response firm. Uh, there's some case law on this. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an area of, let's just say, uh, legal development. It's a little bit unclear. Um, I would say, you know, what, if it happens is the time to do the research on that. Uh, you'll want to uh, find some kind of, you know, uh, find your KIP. To, uh, to lead recovery, you need someone to lead recovery, right? If you, if you have someone in-house, great. If not, you really need an expert in the field to do it. Um, and that can often be on the, the kind of lawyer slash quarterback role. Uh, you do oftentimes want to uh, talk with law enforcement. Uh, there's a couple of reasons for this. Uh, one is, and this is specific to ransomware, but if it's a, if it's a wire fraud issue, you want to talk to law enforcement as soon as possible because if you do it quick enough, there's a chance that that funds can be recovered. Um, and then otherwise, you want to. You, it's part of it is doing the right thing and and getting the information out there to the right people so that they can work to, uh, you know, try to try to increase that arrest percentage. Um, the, one of the largest components, and this is this does get to be more specialized, is. You know what are the reporting obligations? You've got local, state, federal. You've got international law. Um, what what is uh, how are you going to deal with it? Uh, whether or not something is a breach is oftentimes a uh, a combination of both technical and legal analysis. Uh, you have to somehow obtain the facts. That obviously 
involves talking with the incident response firm, but also the client. What did you have? What, what could have been stolen, right? If all you have is a list of email addresses, that's not, a, that's not that big of a deal, right? But if you happen to have the person's email address and their whole name and their address and their mother's maiden name and their social security number and their, you know, their, the name of their dog when they were a kid, you know, this starts to get very bad because uh, now there's a ton of information. The more information the bad guys get, the more harm they can cause. Um, as we kind of mentioned about the, uh, the risk of sanctions, that's a legal issue. Uh, certainly insurance coverage issues is a big problem. And then uh, third party liability and just generally kind of spotting the issues and looking around uh, you know, the doors and corners, so to speak, of, of what's coming next. So that's, that's all what, what the lawyer can do uh, for the, during the incident response process. And, and that's really important because my, my job when I'm uh, playing the role of, of a recovery coordinator or an incident commander, I don't have time to do any of that stuff. It's not possible. Even if I was qualified to do those things, I would not be doing those things. I'm trying to get the business back into operation. Okay, so there was a couple of, of key questions that you might uh, that you might get from from a client. So, you know, what if they're in the middle of a ransomware attack and they call you, probably you know on a Saturday or late at night or something like that? Um, you know, so so how do you respond to that? And, and we've got some suggestions here. So, Jake, you want to cover that? Yeah. So the first thing. The, the first question you always ask is, do you have cyber liability insurance? If so, call the insurance company, call your broker. Um, the beauty of cyber insurance is that it has, it, it's kind of a built-in containment and recovery team. They will have uh, people that you can call who will immediately be able to start this containment and recovery process. Um, and good news, it may even be fully covered. You're probably going to have, um, you know, the the equivalent of the deductible, but you will have uh, you will have some support there. If you don't have cyber liability insurance, uh, tongue in cheek, call me. I'll then I'll call Kip. But really, um, you do need to uh, you need to get in touch with someone who can help you through it as soon as possible. Um, either way, please don't destroy evidence. Uh, it makes it very, very hard to, uh, one, contain and ultimately monitor for future attacks. Um, and to, you know, also you need to know what your obligations look like. For example, if, uh, if it turns out that the only thing that happened is they encrypted your information and left it locally, in other words, there was no data exfiltration, then, you know, depending on the state, you may not have reporting obligations. On the other hand, if you know that data was stolen and taken from your systems, that changes your reporting obligations. So it, it gets complicated very quickly. It, you know, it would be ideal if there was one clear federal standard, but there's not. For, for now, we have the patchwork to deal with. Yeah, and that's something that the, um, the cyber li liability insurance teams are actually very good at. They actually have teams of people that know what the requirements are in all 50 states, and they can quickly get you those answers much faster than you can probably get on your own. So there's a second question that you might get asked, which is, you know, a client may come to you and say, look, I'm not having a ransomware attack, but, you know, my friend who's the chief operating officer over this other company that's very similar to ours, they did just go through one or they're going through one right now. What do we do? So in that case, what, you're, what, you, what you found yourself uh, in is a prevention situation, right? So you've got a client saying, I don't want to go through that pain. Keep, you know, please help me avoid that. And so you know, what, what you're going to do is you're going to, you're going to need to offer them some kind of a prioritized mitigation roadmap, right? And that's what cyber risk opportunities, that's what I specialize in doing. So if it was my customer, if it was my client, then... I would build them a cyber risk management action plan, which would cover ransomware prevention, plus other things too, like business email compromise, different financial frauds. I mean, there's all kinds of things that are going on right now, um, not just ransomware. And, and you can actually protect against a wide gamut of cyber attacks if you do it in a very smart way. And when we do it there, we, you know, we're giving them a prioritized list of mitigations, a deployment plan, templates, to, to let them uh, do the mitigations as fast as possible. 
And the way we price it is based on the size and the sophistication of the company that we're working with. So one of the things that I've been trying very, very, very hard to do is to figure out a way to help smaller companies. I mean, we work with companies uh, on a regular basis, uh, up, upwards to about a billion dollars of annual revenue. But companies that are that are very small, you know, under 100 employees, under 25 employees, it's very difficult for them to know what to do. But we actually work with companies at that scale, and we're working with them at price points that, that actually um, make sense for them. A lot of smaller companies are, are absolutely priced out of getting professional help on this because they just simply cannot afford the, the fees. So as we come to the end here, um, you know, we had somebody ask about cyber hygiene. So this, this is what, this is the kinds of things that constitutes good cyber hygiene in this situation. So first is you're going to want ransomware proof data backups. And we, we have what we call the three, two, one rule to kind of guide you in, in creating uh, backups that are ransomware proof. But you can do data backups with all kinds of different products. And really what we tell people to do is is okay, we're gonna tell you the three, two, one rule, but you really need to call your vendor and you need to ask them, how do I configure these systems so that I'm providing a ransomware proof uh, backup? So the three, two, one rule, real quick, you want three copies of all your data. So you want one copy that you're working with in your in, you know, so-called production environment. And then you want two backup copies on different media. By that, I mean, you might have one set of backups on hard drives. You might have another set of backups on tape drives. You might have another set of backups in some kind of a cloud system that's offline. And one of those, one of those backups does need to be offline. In other words, something that the ransomware cannot find or that the criminals cannot find when they're scouring your network and trying to prepare for the attack. Two-factor authentication on all your admin accounts and really on every account, if you can figure out how to do it, two-factor authentication is, um, is amazingly effective at preventing account takeover. You're going to want a, a ransomware incident response playbook because you do not want to make this up at the time that you become infected is not the time to figure out how to respond to this. You, you're going to want some kind of a crisis response plan, a business continuity plan, because if you, if you think back to these two, two uh, cases that we worked on, these are businesses that were shut down for four, four weeks, you know, give or take more or less. And how, how, do you, how do you maintain the trust and the confidence of your customers when you can't serve them? You need, you need a plan and you need people who can do that. And then finally, a robust cyber liability insurance policy, which um, I think we've talked enough about that to uh, hopefully so that you understand, you know, there's a lot of real value there, uh, even though it can be a difficult thing to purchase. All right. So thank you very much. We've made it to the end. We've got some time. I'm happy to stick around past the top of the hour if you have uh, questions. So if anybody does have questions, let's go ahead and take them now. And Melinda, you are the facilitator. So would you remind people how you'd like them to uh, ask questions? Absolutely. So I have the chat room open if you want to put your questions in there um, and raise your hand afterwards and we'll make sure we start going through all your questions. We also take comments as long as they're um, complimentary. <laughs> you mean at yeah. no charge? <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I'm a uh, good point. Yeah. The questions are yeah. puns. What are you going to do? Yeah, I know. I got you. I got you again. That's all right. You'll get me again someday. So uh, yeah, come on, folks. Does anybody uh, here? And, and of course, you can you can email us at, at our email yes. addresses um, as well. Of course, yeah. If there's something you want to talk about, but it's not appropriate for for you know to be talked about in a group, you can reach out to us. Is there anybody who has actually gone through this already? Has actually had a client call you with a ransomware attack in progress, or just you know with concerns about it and wanting to protect themselves? Okay, well, seeing um, silence. Um, oh, wait. We got one in from Jeffrey. So the, go ahead. Okay, I'm just going to ask it. How have you ever seen a global? 
conglomerate incident response plan for each region, or are they separated by business units? Mm. So I've seen it both ways. It, it what it often turns out, what it, yeah, the decision to do it one way versus the other often turns on how that the conglomerate is currently structured. So if there's a lot of centralized services, for example, if in, if the IT uh, department is highly centralized and you've got other uh, centralized uh, uh, you know headquarters services, then you'll often see a, a monolithic response plan maybe with some customizations for different business units. But if the, if the IT is highly distributed along with you know, legal and, and contracting and other services, then, then you'll typically see business units will be responsible for having their own response plans. That's what I've seen. Jake, any comment? Um, I, I've, seen, I, I've seen something similar. Um, really, it's, it's the business unit by business unit, depending on how their operations differ or are the same. It, it's, it, you can see both. What percentage of the network becomes infected before quarantine the company? Uh, okay, well, I can, so 100% in both. Yeah, I mean, that was, they were, there was no detection. So there, the quarantine, I mean, the, the quarantine um, hypothetically could have become effective, you know, if someone was able to spot it as it was going in and then cut it off. And that, and that does happen. Um, that does happen from time to time. But in both these incidents, uh, it was not, it was not seen. All files, all laptops, all desktops. So a lot of these, uh, yes, and all servers. Some, but I think the primary target for most of these was the servers, um, and then for the simple reason that these companies were all they were, you know, nobody was supposed to have local storage. Um, so I, you know, same effect. But there, but yes, the, yeah. The thing is, is that they're going to go to where the data is, right? These are right. not. These are not low sophisticated brute force methods, right? These are highly sophisticated, highly targeted uh, attacks. So they're gonna find where your data is and then, and then they're gonna make sure that they get it. And they'll take time to do it. Other questions? All right, I do actually have to run, unfortunately. Yeah. So um, if you have questions, you can uh, contact me and uh, be happy to take them offline or online just via a different media. And it is top of the hour. So uh, we thank you for being here. And I would encourage everybody to uh, let us know how we can support you. If you would like a, uh, a, a consultation with Jake or myself, we'd be happy to do that. And um, we really appreciate you being here. And let us know if there's, if there's anything else that we can do to support you. All right. Looks like um, Melinda, if you could... Uh, stay on briefly. There's some people who are looking for your uh, attention, um, but I got to run. Thanks, everybody. No problem. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And I will reach out to you, Harold. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Bye.